Hi, join me for episode two of Tech User Labs, where we're going to be looking at removing barriers to learning and how we can personalize learning for students that need that extra support. Hi there. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at overcoming barriers to learning uh, using accessibility features to give extra support to those students that really need it and to personalize learning for them. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do uh, is just uh, give a bit of background on me. I am a fully qualified primary school teacher that works in a special educational needs school in central London called Abaddon House School that's part of the Cavendish Group. Uh, I started as a primary school teacher. I now teach full secondary, uh, mainly IT. I've got a split role, so three days a week I teach uh, class, I teach IT and I teach maths. And two days a week I train for the Cavendish group showing teachers and students how to use technology more effectively to engage students in learning. Uh, Abner House School itself has got 91 students, uh, 82 of those have got EHCPs um, and we have another 10 in the process of getting them. Uh, we're technically a private school but we are about 95% uh, local authority funded at the moment. So, uh, what I'd like to do today is start off uh, just looking, first of all, at a little bit of pedagogy around accessibility features, why they work, um, show you how we use them, and then get into actually showing you how the students use them in the class. Uh, so a recent study from NASA and the Department for Education um, put forward some really interesting information. Their uh, study looked at the impact of accessibility features um, for mainstream students. Uh, they found that 96% of the respondents to the study found that accessibility features had a positive impact on learner engagement. 96% of the respondents found that it had a positive impact on student mental health. 93% of the respondents showed that it had a positive impact on student independence, which is massive when it comes to those students that need that extra bit of support. Um, so really all round, we found that those accessibility features uh, were really impactful in helping develop student independence on top of all things. Uh, what I'd like to do actually is start with a little experiment. Um, and I'd like you to take part with this at home if you can. I saw this first of all at the Betfair um, from the head of SEN for Scotland. And it was the first time I saw about 300 people in a crowd understand what accessibility features did fully. Um, so I'd just like to take part in this. If you wear glasses, I'd just like you to take them off for the moment, um, just to take part in this experiment at home. So I've put some, I'm about to put some text up on the screen and most people should be able to read that nice and bold. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is move on to the next bit. As you can see, it's got a bit smaller, but most people should be fine. Now, some of you might just struggle here. And if you do, I want you to know that you're the problem. Other people can read this text absolutely fine. So don't put your glasses back on. What I want you to do is just try harder to read it. As we go on now, some of you might be struggling, just know that there are people that can still do this, so you're the issue. You need to try harder to read this without your glasses, okay? If there's one person that can still read this, we should all be trying to hit that level. And as we go down, I know there are people that can still read this, so please, just try harder to read it. Right, feel free to put your glasses back on now. So, what we looked at uh, at Abaddon House School was how we could start tracking this and what the impact would be. Now it's worth mentioning at this point there is very little research, um, modern research anyway, around accessibility features um, and actually that transition from handwriting to typing and typing to voice typing and screen readers. Um, it's a very modern thing. Computers have just really become prevalent in schools outside of the IT lab very recently. Um, so the research there, there isn't much to it. And that lack of research doesn't mean that it doesn't help. It just means it hasn't been looked at. So um, when we started to look at it, we just thought, where can we get a quick baseline for our students so they can, we can see where they are and we can see the impact that these things are having. Now, I know in a lot of schools, the first time that people might think of this would actually just be around exam season in year 11. And it really needs to be looked at much 
earlier before that. Uh, what we want to try and develop is a real standard way of working, not just in exams, but for life for some of these students. And technology is so at our hands now, it is an easy, easy way to get going. So, what we started to do was we developed something called a student technology diet. This looked at uh, handwriting, typing, voice typing, screen readers, um, and also uh, coloured overlays, but we sort of went away from that a little bit at the end. Uh, the main focus was on developing a standard way of working for students early on in their lives, so it became natural to them to use these things as they went forwards. So, what I'm going to do now is show you some examples of some of our students in their handwriting, their typing and their voice typing to really show you the impact this can have. So the first student I'm going to show you is Mason. Uh, Mason is 15 years old, he's just done his uh, English mock paper and I'm going to come back to that a little bit later and talk about that, about how he went about it because it was really interesting. Uh, but first of all, Mason came to us when he was in year seven. He had, uh, he was very dyslexic, one of the most dyslexic students I've ever met. Real, real trouble handwriting, real trouble writing, uh, real trouble reading. Uh, this is an example of his handwriting at 15. So there are 35 words there, most of them are spelt wrong, no punctuation at all. Uh, the next thing we're gonna show you is his typing. Now again, there's only 38 words there, lots of spelling mistakes, a little bit of punctuation. The next thing I'm going to show you is his voice typing. 163 words in paragraphs, full punctuation. Uh, this was all independent work from him. Now each of those samples was taken in a three minute sample, all given on a different image that the student chose. And as you can see, there's a massive difference between them. This really opened up uh, Mason's ability to be able to engage in work. Uh, the next student is a male student, 14 years old. He's had some experience with voice typing, but not much at this stage. So here we can see that uh, this is an example of his handwriting. Again, uh, lots of spelling mistakes, not much grammar in there. Again, his typing wasn't great, 36 words, again, spelling mistakes, a little bit of uh, punctuation, but not much. We move on to his voice typing and we do 202 words. Uh, with full stops, with some capital letters, it really, again, the amount that's there, it just enabled him to engage into it. So those are the samples side by side and you can really see the difference between those early typing and handwriting samples compared to the voice typing. Uh, we've got a female student, 12 years old. Now this was the first time that she had attempted to use voice typing. Uh, as you can see, 51 words handwritten, no lines, uh, all over the place, spelling mistakes. Typing was much better, 75 words. Uh, better spelling, she actually went back and edited her words much easily, which is a real bonus as soon as you start to use typing and then 280 words when she was voice typing. Now in this, there isn't much punctuation there going on. This was the first time she used it and she had her mind blown by how much she could produce in that time. It really opened up her fluency. And lastly, it's really important to see, we've got a 13 year old female student, really important to highlight that um, voice typing isn't for everyone. So she'd never used voice typing before. Now this is really beautiful, neat handwriting. Uh, you might not even question, apart from the amount of text that's there, if the student would even need to use typing or voice typing. However, when we now look at her typing sample, she did 72 words, uh, all fully punctuated, all really clear, nearly double the amount. When she tried to use the voice typing, she only did 72 words. She stopped after a minute. She didn't like it. She just found it conversational. So in this type, uh, we'd realised that typing would be best for her. Now. Uh, we did this over the school. Uh, we've got the results here that we got from across the school. And this is how personalised we can make this system. Uh, with mixtures of handwriting, typing, coloured overlays, voice typing, we had a massive range across the school of how these technologies were used. Uh, out of the 77 students that we had at the time, only two students used uh, 
handwriting as their primary way of working and for one of those it was due to behaviour. Uh, seven of our students were on voice typing only as their standard way of working and we uh, helped put in a system around them so they could start using it more effectively. So that's the impact that uh, typing, voice typing screen readers can have in a real short uh, period of time. Uh, with Mason in particular, we saw that he took his uh, English mock recently and he passed with a high pass using voice typing and screen readers as his standard way of working. The English teacher actually tried using a scribe in that mock exam to see if it would be better for him and Mason asked him to go away after 20 minutes and give him his headset back because it's just what he was used to. And then he went on to pass that with a high pass. He actually took his maths GCSE a year early last year and passed. Um, which was amazing and he used the voice typing all the way through that paper. So now we'll have a look at how we actually can use this in the class. How do we get our students to use this technology? Well the first thing is setting them up with the right thing. Uh, it's important to use, I, we're a Google school, um, we use Google Classroom, we use Google Docs, Slide Sheets and Chromebooks, all our students have one-to-one -one devices, uh, but all of the main uh, providers, Microsoft, uh, Mac and Chrome, all have very similar products based when it comes to things like dictation, uh, narration or voice typing or screen readers. Uh, Microsoft have an immersive reader which I'm really jealous of as a Google user, but they all have these accessibility features built into their standard products now. So they're really easy to use, uh, no matter what device you're on. But it's really important to think about how your students are actually going to use them. Now we also buy into a system called Read Write, which we found at BET, uh, which is a universal accessibility features toolbar. It works at about £3 a student a year or something like that. Um, but it's cross-platform, so that means that once you're signed in once, you've got it set up, a student can log in, download the app, and they have full access to it at home. So. How the students actually use these things. First of all, really important to set them up with the right thing. A uh, good noise cancelling headset. You can pick them up for about 20 quid. Um, it's really important to use one of these things. If you don't use these, then you're just going to have students shouting at computers and it's not going to work. Uh, with these, I know a lot of student teachers worry about noise in the class. Students don't want to be shouting, they want to be doing their work quite peacefully and with a decent headset they can do that and I've got one of my classes has got six students that all use headsets and it's absolutely fine, they can all understand themselves, they all use them independently. So how they actually use them in a document. So I'm going to look at here again, that student has real struggle engaging their learning with reading and with writing. Um, they're gonna look at this document and I got some of these students using uh, voice typing and screen readers in a way where students with a really low level engagement could engage fully independently in Harry Potter. Uh, so, the first thing we got our students to do was get trained that when they went in, all of my worksheets looked exactly the same so they knew how to approach it. The first thing they do would be to come in and they'd use the screen reader to read the question to them. What is the address of Mr. and Mrs. Dursley? After they did that, they can listen to it. They then come down to the text I put below and again, use the screen reader to read that to them. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive. Once they had that read to them, they then use the voice typing to put their answer in. So, they'd come in and say, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley lived at number four, Privet Drive. Now, at this stage, they'd then, that student might not be able to read that back to themselves. So again, they'd go back to the screen reader, they'd come in, highlight that. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley lived at number four, Private Drive and have it read back to them. Now at that stage they can see that they've made a spelling mistake there. They might not be able to correct it themselves, but they might try. So delete that word. Privet. Uh, 
Again, use the screen reader. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley lived at number four private drive. They might not know that, that word is still incorrect. And at that stage, they could mark it and highlight it as one that they knew wasn't correct and to come back and ask a teacher about it later. That's the system that we try to instill in them uh, to use, would be to go on, use the screen reader to read that question to them, answer the question as best they could using the voice typing and then have that read back to them. With that overlap of technology, it made it really effective in students completely independently engaging in work without needing an adult there to help them. And that really simple way of going about it just enabled learners to build their independence and build up on what they were doing. Uh, that is it. It's a really simple system, but it is about engaging your learners, really building up their ability to use it and normalising this as a way of working. This voice typing and screen readers shouldn't be seen as just a jump to get you back into handwriting or a jump to get you back into typing. They should really just become that standard way of working. And as teachers, we should try and normalise that for our students. If you wanted to start this and try it straight away, the best advice I can give is, first of all, as an educator, is to try this technology yourself. Uh, go on to whatever operating system you have, have a look at your voice typing, have a look at your screen reader, and try it. Get to using it yourself so you're confident with it. Then go away and find those one, two, three students that you know it's going to have the biggest impact to, that are most likely to use it and develop it themselves. Use them to help you guide your learning through it because the way that the students use it will be the most organic way for your setting.